right? I want the best talent on the field, and I have to build a platform and a structure that is safe to do that. Not only getting them in the room, that's the diversity, but including them, right? Including them where it's safe, where they can engage. It's psychologically safe so that they can engage. I'm glad that you brought up um, the difference between diversity and inclusion, Mm -hmm. okay? Because I think that's oftentimes missed. In fact, I really didn't think too much of it until our conversation earlier before we, we started recording, you know, diversity uh, versus including. It's, you know, one thing to have the people on the team. It's another to use them. Welcome to A State of Readiness, a podcast set as a fireside chat with business leaders to discuss what it takes for a company to be in a state of readiness and become a higher performance organization with your host, Joseph Paris. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of State of Readiness. I'm your host, Joseph Paris. Today, it gives me great pleasure to have as my guest, Billy Taylor. Billy spent 30 years with the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, serving as Director of North American Operations and Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, where he led diversity and inclusion strategies for 64,000 employees across the 22 countries where Goodyear operates. Billy is now the president of Linked Excel, a firm he founded that specializes in helping companies architect their business operating systems. Billy is a dynamic speaker and leadership guru who is routinely called upon by universities, international conferences, global publications, and the U.S. Armed Forces to demonstrate how to drive and sustain effective results through creating a culture of leadership and enabling employee ownership. Welcome, Billy. Welcome to State of Readiness. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be on the show today and speak with you. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I came across you as, you know, uh, we're apt to do on LinkedIn, you know, we get connected sometimes and and we never speak. In fact, I don't know if you and I have ever actually spoken, maybe once uh, some time ago, but uh, I don't remember the conversation. Right. I don't think we did. I think we, we had common friends in industry and yeah. uh, we kind of spoke through some friends, but that was it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, thank you for taking the time. Um, you know, what uh, really attracted me to you um, was, of course, uh, you know, being the, the uh, head of uh, global diversity and inclusion at Goodyear. OK, that's the headline title at the time. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, scrolling down, you know, you know, the headline catches the attention. But then I scrolled down your, your profile and, and uh, your journey, and I thought you had a very, very fascinating journey overall. Um, you know, Goodyear being an amazing company to begin with, but just, you know, uh, the things that, uh, you know, you experienced on your way. And, you know, I I won't say that you and I are contemporaries. I think I might be a couple of years older than you, but uh, we're close enough that, uh, you know, we've probably had similar, uh, but different uh, experiences. And and I just really wanted to hear your story. Yeah, actually, I, I actually started with Goodyear front line. So I was a third shift. Once I graduated with electrical engineering degree, I actually started on night shift, third shift. So I spent about six years as a front line supervisor in a, a union facility. And so from that, I started to work, work my way up to various positions. But what was interesting is the, 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 the rise came through people, okay, that embraced processes. So I had to understand the relationships between people, process, and assets. And so my journey, as I went to each level, I really realized you have to earn the right to grow, earn the right to change. And there's two different rights. There's the technical right and the cultural right. So me, as a young leader coming up, being a minority, that trust factor, I went from that to running a a department. I had my first plan at a very young age. Uh, and those things that, that the common thread in that sweater of, of progression was the ability to navigate the relationships between people and the assets to what was the common goal. And so, right. you know, I, I went through a lot of the frontline roles before I went to ever achieve uh, any ex, uh, executive status. So um, when did, at what age uh, did you become the plant manager uh, and where was that plant? So the first plant I worked was Kingman, Arizona. It's right outside of Las Vegas. Uh, I was a very young, I want to say 36, 
year old, uh, being a plant manager for the first time, um, it was challenging. Uh, I knew enough to know what I knew, but I didn't know enough to know when I was wrong. And that's when I really had to embrace uh, the people side of excellence. Um, and so when, as I went through that role, think about it, uh, you raising children, you know, when you're talking standards, leadership standards, what you accept is the standard. What you walk by is the standard. Uh, and so uh, standards drive consistency. And I would try to negotiate people liking me. I would try to negotiate being trusted. I try to negotiate those things. And what I realize is be hard on the process and you can be easy on the people. And so when I went through those roles, we started getting milestone performances. And so once we, we, we got there, the, the, the thought process came was once you change the guard, how do you guard the change? How do you sustain those gains through people, through processes, but more importantly, through governance? So we built rigorous govern governance processes, uh, working with teams, aligning to win. And, and from that, uh, we took a place, and, 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 and we talk about diversity and inclusion. I was the first uh, Black person, uh, African-American, to walk in the, to, to work in that plant. To and, work and in the a, plant. To work in the plant. Okay. And, and so think about that. In the community, they were, there were zero... 0.7% African Americans in the whole town. It's sort of like being uh, on the Green Bay Packers, uh, ah. <laughs> you know, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that team embraced me. What, what right. did they embrace? They embraced my value proposition. They embraced how I treated them. They embraced that inclusion piece of making them feel valued. Right, right. And, and you had, you held them to the standard of the process, Absolutely. not individually. So, Absolutely. so, so you depersonalized the conflict because the conflict was actually with the process. Absolutely. Yeah. And it wasn't non, it was non-confrontational. Right. And, and, and at that point, both of our value propositions was escalated. And then, right. And, 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 and another thing we really did there was, again, we celebrated the process, not the individual. We embrace the individual right. for following the process. And that's how they were recognized. Yeah. So and in return, when I left or uh, when I would go take vacation, the plant ran better when I left than when I was there. So I have a question about the, pro <laughs> that's funny. I have a question about the, um, the processes. Um, you obviously must have engaged, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so you'll you know correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you obviously engaged the people in developing the processes. Hundred percent. Okay. So what you know in in our world, in the the process improvement world, we talk about people, processes, and technology. Mm -hmm. All right. But what I usually see, and this is is fraught with peril, is that it's implemented in the in the reverse order. Somebody mm -hmm. buys. A piece of technology and you use the word asset but somebody buys a piece of technology they form a bunch of processes around it and then they introduce the people that are going to be running the processes you know well, what I mean? this. go ahead no, I'm, no, I'm smiling because you, you, you no, actually no. identified the technical right right leaders give you all of those things we've all to and we, we think people should just go do it all right and right you, you nailed it you 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 described what happens in plants and, and and businesses all over the country, they don't spend the time to engage them in the developing the how to, right? They do change to the people, not with the people. Right, right. And then the saying goes, you know, either the people will change or the people will change. That's right. You know, they'll be changed out. And mm -hmm. and I think this is, you know, this is obviously the upside down and backwards way to go about it. You know, mm -hmm. given a chance. If you if you share with your team what the aspirations are uh, in detailed fashion, when I say detailed fashion, I mean uh, unmistakably uh, what the objectives are, they will help to develop a, a path to meet that challenge. 
um, you know, I, in my book, I use uh, one of my, my a vision statement. Vision statements are different than mis mission statements. Vision statements to me are specific. Mission statements have a tendency to be uh, fuzzy. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of my favorite vision statements is JFK's vision of going to the moon. You know, he said, mm -hmm. by the end of this decade, which gave us a deadline, all right, we're going to send a man to the moon and return him safely back to Earth. Mm -hmm. Okay, unmistakable. There was no warmth in there. There was no detail in there other than what the goal was. Mm -hmm. And I think the challenge sometimes with businesses is we talk in, uh, you know, uh, we'll call it generalities. Uh, yeah. For instance, a president of a company might come out and say, we're going to be the number one such and such on the face of the planet. Yes. And everybody goes away thinking, what is number one? What does number one mean? Is yes. it number one in sales, profitability, market share, customer satisfaction? Okay. And if I don't know what number one means, I'm going to internalize it and pursue number one from where I stand. So Absolutely. if I'm in marketing, I'm going to say, I want the biggest market awareness. And if I'm in the warehouse, I want 100% on time delivery. And mm -hmm. now you're trying to split uh, the log with a sledgehammer and not an ax. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. And, and one of the things I, I, I talk to leaders that I work with is around deliberate clarity. Yeah, right? exactly when I say, correct. Right? Defining winning. We, as human beings, are wired to know what winning is, to know what the end game. From the moment you get in your car and you're going somewhere, that destination, when you load something into your GPS, that destination, you go to a football game, soccer game, basketball, we want to know what winning is. Right. And we show up to see who wins. All right. And so leaders have to be deliberately clear, deliberately clear on what winning is. And also be deliberate around how you deliver the message uh, of what winning is, right? Because it's not about a common language in most cases. It's about a common meaning for retention right. and understanding. Right. I often say when I get off the plane in, in Americana or Brazil, they greet me with hola. All right. I go to New York, it's hello. I go to Texas, it's howdy. Right? They all mean the same thing. And so understanding that for deliberate clarity is critical on what winning is. And, and right. you know, you can't align the win. Think about the three steps of excellence when you're talking about leadership. Define, can you d define, align, and then execute? Right. If you haven't defined what winning is first, then how can you align the win? No matter what sport you're playing, no matter what team you're involved in, if you haven't been deliberately clear, after you've been deliberately clear, now you have to focus on deliberate ownership. Right. Who right. owns what? Right. Because in the absence of ownership comes blame. Right, right. So let's talk about, um, you know, the, the um, howdy, hello, uh, you know, the, you know, challenges in, in culture and leading up to your last role at uh, Goodyear diversity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for the last, you know, few years, uh, you know, diversity has been front and center of a lot of, uh, you know, corporate aspirations. Uh, and, you know, and it's, you know, but I think that corporations are sometimes pulled by uh, society rather than understanding truly what the intent is. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know if I articulated that well, but, um, you know, and I'm going to share, you know, you and I have had both had the good fortune of being able to walk the earth. You know, I know that you've been in the EU at the Goodyear plants there. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm in Germany. Um, and I got to tell you, you know, to me, one of the single, and, and I know this is going to go against uh, what people in the States largely believe, yeah. but my true belief is that one of, if not the greatest uh, competitive advantage companies based in the U.S. have is their diversity. You know, I know that, it, you know, people think there's not enough, whatever that might mean, whatever metric is being used to measure that. But, you know, I look around a boardroom or a, you know, a, a team in the States, and I see people from all walks of life, 
I see men and women. I see people from India, from Europe, from Africa. Um, I see, uh, and certainly, uh, you know, uh, south of the border, Mexico and Brazil, you know, and I look at all this diversity and it tells me that when people are looking at an opportunity, you know, a challenge of some sort, they're coming at it with their different perspectives. You know, so for instance, um, a South African, you know, I've been to South Africa, you know, quite a few times in Mozambique and Southern Africa in general. And if a machine breaks down in Southern Africa, they don't wait to get the right part to fix it. They're going to fix it with coat hanger wire, duct tape, and WD-40. And they just have to get it up and operational. Mm -hmm. That same machine breaks down in Germany, and they will implement a fix that 10,000 years from now, an archaeologist will find and it'll still be working. Mm-hmm. You know, Americans don't think things all the way through. We don't think, mm-hmm. you know, in ten, uh, years of 10,000, like the Germans might. Okay. This is not to say that anyone is good or bad, just mm-hmm. different. And the advantage of the American company is they have all of this different looking at the same challenge. And the mm-hmm. saying goes, if everybody's thinking the same, nobody's thinking. Mm-hmm. You know, I go to a German company, especially a Mittelstein company, and, um, you know, everybody is German and everybody's looking at that challenge from a German perspective. In fact, I don't know if you remember when um, uh, uh, Daimler uh, Benz bought Chrysler, you know, back, uh, you know, whenever it was. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, it was supposed to be a marriage of equals. OK, mm-hmm. uh, but it, it, from headquarters, uh, Ben's uh, headquarters in Stuttgart, um, the joke was that, you know, uh, Daimler uh, Chrysler, uh, you know, in German, the Chrysler is silent, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and and so, um, you know, I think this diversity is um, under celebrated in the United States compared to what the reality is, especially compared to other countries. I think that Canada and and the UK also have a very diverse workforce um, uh, for similar reasons uh, as the US. But um, what are your what are your thoughts on that? I think diversity is is how we thrive. It's what's what causes us to thrive. Even the think about going in the store, diverse choices. Even in America, you, you go have breakfast, it's like t- taking a pop quiz, right? Because, what the, you know, what do you want? You want sausage, bacon, ham. How do you want your eggs? Scramble over easy. What do you want your toast? Wheat, whole rye. This, right? you want to, it's like taking a test to order breakfast, right? The diversity is what we crave. And so even our day-to-day activities, what we buy, cars, we want different colors, we want different models. We want a choice. We want diversity in our life. It's now embedded in the DNA of how we think. But often when we go into businesses, that DNA, uh, that that diversity in our DNA tends to get shut down. We surround ourselves with like-minded people. Uh, We surround ourselves uh, with people that are going to basically cancel out some of the best ideas for that company. And those organizations that I've seen and work with in my new company, as well as Goodyear, Uh, Leaders that become stagnant and teams that become stagnant are those that start to cancel out diversity of thought because diversity, right, is what drives that change. Inclusion is the how you get that change. And if those people are not in the room, a famous friend of mine said, if you're not in the meeting, you're not in the deal. Right. Right. And so you have to get those people. And we joke, I joke about. You know, and I, and a guy said to me once, you're pretty smart. And I said, yes, I have 13 degrees. I should be. He says, what do you mean? I says, I earned two and I hired 11. Right. right? And I use all 13 of them. Why? Because I have blind spots. I have weaknesses. I have gaps. And I surround myself with people that are strong. And it doesn't matter if you're male, female, LGBTQ. I want the best talent on the field and I have to build a platform and a structure that is safe to do that. Not only getting them in the room, that's the diversity, but including them, right? Including them where it's safe, where they can engage. It's psychologically safe so that they can engage. I'm glad that you brought up um, the difference between diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because 
I think that's oftentimes missed. In fact, I really didn't think too much of it until our conversation earlier before we we started recording. You know, diversity uh, versus including. It's you know one thing to have the people on the team; it's another to use them. You know, mm -hmm. and you made reference to having 13 degrees, and it, it makes me recall um, uh, a lesson my father taught when I was uh, very, very young. Uh, he he told me that if I ever am the smartest person in the room, then I'm in the wrong room. That's right. Okay. You know, you have to hire yourself, uh, hire a team around you, and associate uh, uh, with a team that's around you uh, that is going to challenge you i don't know if you golf for instance yes. when i golf with somebody that's worse than me i lay back you know what i mean i mm -hmm. take it easy uh when i am golfing with somebody that's better than me and mind you i'm not good okay so you know <laughs> make make no mistake i'm not a good golfer but when i um uh golf with somebody that's better than me i get more serious you know what i mean i want to do better and i know you know golf is different than any other sport because you can never beat the other player you can only play better than them. That's right. Okay. That's right. So, uh, yeah. So this is a, you know an indi you know an individual achievement. I'm not talking about the Ryder Cup or anything like that, but I'm talking about like you know match play. Uh, you know, uh, am I playing better than the other player? And that's all that it comes down to at the end of the day. Yeah, and you know, and here's the thing that people don't want to talk about when it comes to diversity and inclusion. It's not just okay to put that demographic in the room. That's not good enough. Because you do more damage to that demographic than you do good, right? Because now you built this stereotype or this, this paradigm around that specific dem demographic. Because you have to, again, go back to what we said, be deliberately clear of what they own. Be deliber deliberately clear of, of what winning is. And then allow them to go in there. And then allow them to fail some cases and help them with, with gap closure. And it's something my mother would tell my brothers and I, and, and, and I tell a story about me playing football. And I was one of the best players in the state of Texas in the eighth grade. My mother had a standard around education that if we made less than a B, we couldn't play. I made an F a week before the most important game of that team. We were undefeated playing for the city championship. She took me off the team. Yikes. We lost the game. Now, Everybody thinks that may be cruel, but it wasn't. She set the standard for me to grow into a productive adult. She set that standard and she held to the standard. Right. And so, and she, and she knew often, you could do it. She, she knew, knew you should, I could do it. Right. But you know what she told me at the end of that? She said, you had everything you needed to be successful, to do the homework, the environment to study, the tools you needed. She said, it was between desire and capability and, and capability. I had been working on you with that, but desire, I couldn't coach you on that. And she said, let me tell you something why I took you out. See, if I fight all your fights, I'll steal all your victories. And leaders that want so much control, they stop their teams from growing when they want to control and fight all the battles. They also steal all the victories. And therefore, they start eliminating people that don't think like them, that don't act like them. And that's right. when those teams fail. And I see it at the highest level of the organization, and I see it from little league sports team. That's so, replicated. So, you know, let's – one of the challenges I have in – um, diversity and inclusion. I'm going to use a, you know, I don't want to say an incendiary word, but something that's going to get people's attention is um, how fraught with peril it is. Um, you know, we walk on eggshells because we're afraid to say or use the wrong term. You know what I mean? We're afraid to uh, share an honest thought because we're concerned about a, somebody being offended by it. Yeah. Okay. Not that we're going to offend them. Okay. Because we're not, you know, most people, I believe that most people are good and they're out, not out there to hurt anybody or offend anybody, okay? So now we have to worry about how the message is received and interpreted by somebody else uh, whose reaction is beyond our control, mm -hmm. assuming that we're good people, okay? And, yeah. and I, like I said, I, I believe most people are, are good. So if I'm afraid to deliver a message 
because uh, either the person doesn't want to hear it, which, you know, people don't want to hear bad news, but that doesn't make, it may, I mean, it doesn't exist, right? But if I'm also worried about how I wrap that message, um, then, uh, then, you know, our effectiveness, our, ba our ability to be effective is diminished. Like, you know, if my wife asks me how I am and I say, fine, it has an entirely different meaning than when I ask her, how she is, and she says fine. Absolutely. Okay. When I say fine, I mean you know everything's okay. They got no issues. Mm -hmm. When she says fine, it usually means that there's issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here we are saying the same word, and one person is interpreting it in an entirely different way, or meaning it in an entirely different way as uh, you know as as another. And so I I worry sometimes that you know let's use pronouns for an example. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, if I use somebody's uh, uh, if I use a pronoun that is uh, that somebody doesn't particularly care for and they want to be uh, have a different pronoun used, you know, I've got no issues with that, but I also might not remember it. OK, um, and I'm reminded of Hanlon's razor. Did you ever hear of Hanlon's razor? Yes. OK, so, you know, don't uh, uh, don't uh, believe that there is malice when 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 it sat the explanation is satisfied by simple stupidity. Mm -hmm. OK, so this doesn't mean that I'm out there maliciously trying to um, offend you by not using a proper pronoun. I just mm -hmm. forgot. It's stupid on my part. But I think that, you know, the person who might take offense needs to be a little bit more forgiving and understanding and patient. Just as you are with your employees, you know, mm -hmm. when you're at Goodyear, you had a person who might have been a rookie. They're not mm -hmm. proficient at task. Okay. It doesn't mean that they're stupid. Okay. It doesn't mean that they're purposefully doing a, a poor job. It just mm -hmm. means that they haven't grown into that position. And, mm -hmm. you know, as leaders, we have to be patient and pressing and help this person become successful. Yeah. And I think sometimes that level of uh, impatience at one level maybe um, uh, intolerance at another level, I think that uh, does more harm to diversity and inclusion than perhaps um, is possible. Absolutely. And, and one of the things, here's what my experience with that, uh, being on both sides of, the, of that spectrum, right? The person that may think something's offensive and the person delivering the message that may offend someone. And, and so... And in some cases, I'm going to start with, from the white male perspective, this is from CEOs of multiple companies that have brought me in and we've had conversations around being shamed into supporting diversity and inclusion. And the fear that if I say something wrong, uh, the consequences, so it's safer not to say nothing or do right. very little, right? And so uh, you don't want to play the shame game. You want to be, that point is that, that awareness and knowledge. Remember, uh, well, you not remember, I often say you can't manage a secret. Right. And if it's secrets, so when I say with leaders, what my, my experience in, as a leader of a company and working with leaders, even female leaders that are making the transition is understanding and awareness, education, and go ask the experts. Create this trusted board of yours ask the experts don't try to uh guess at it or 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 or, or, or just wade through it uh i, I use the example again with mom when i asked my dad for the first time i'm like dad i've got this date I, i'm excited dad how do i treat a woman dad how do i do it do i open the door for her? do i what do i do do i push a chair in and all of a sudden my mom starts laughing at me. and i said mom mom what are you laughing at he said, why in the heck are you asking him? He don't know. All he knows <laughs> is what I told him. <laughs> Ask me, I'm the expert, right? <laughs> and so <laughs> that's the example. When I look at leaders at the senior level, go find you a panel like the Billy Taylors that can say rich, you know, or whoever came to me uh, a senior level and says, how do you, what do you like to be called? What do you mean? Black? color african-american what do you mean well really color is kind of a little offensive depending on who you are african-american black is safe but you know what the correct answer just call me billy i was gonna say 
Just yep. call me Billy, man. And then yep. we start laughing about it. And that's material for fodder as a leader going out there saying, you know what? I'm getting a better understanding. We have these ERGs. We're doing this. Here's our strategy. And then here's our form to discuss these type of issues. People go, wow. Right, right. How do I get diverse pools of candidates? Create a slate point where, you know what, we want a mandatory that not only these people be interviewed, but again, if you're not in the meeting, you're not in the deal. So if I don't have no plan to interview females, then they're never going to get the opportunity. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I was just reading recently where, uh, you know, the actor Tom Hanks, right? Um, one of his greatest movies, in my opinion, was uh, Philadelphia, where he played a lawyer uh, who was uh, um, uh, caught a a AIDS, was you know, or yeah, caught HIV, developed AIDS, and was fired from a law firm, and then he sued uh, the law firm. And I thought he did a magnificent job acting. I believe he even won an Academy Award for it. But recently, he uh, made mention that if he had the opportunity to, to star in that role today, he would mm -hmm. decline it um, because, because he isn't gay. Mm -hmm. And I, I wow. just thought, uh, yeah, right. Wow. I mean, isn't because he, he didn't he, he felt it inappropriate because he wasn't uh, gay to play somebody who's gay. And I think this is I think we're going down the wrong road, um, you know, when, when we're thinking about you know, not being able to be empathetic. I mean, that's ultimately what, you know, he's an actor. Mm -hmm. He's supposed to walk in somebody else's shoes or try. I mean, yeah. I can't walk in your shoes and you can't walk. In. Right. I have life experiences uh, that you could never know and vice versa. We each have, we're each our own. Mm -hmm. However, I believe that it's, you know, our, you know, if not uh, our um, uh, responsibility, our duty to be able to be empathetic and try to understand, um, yes. you know, the the challenges and the aspirations of somebody else from That's their right. perspective. That's right. Um, you know, so for him to say that really um, yes. struck me as maybe maybe this um, uh, you know this uh, you know uh, 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 we'll call it journey to learn about uh, and embrace diversity and inclusion. Uh, is starting to be perverted to actually be exclusion. Yes. Um, and I think that it, that's a that's a a dangerous path to walk down. And uh, I think that we all should guard against it. Um, yes. Because you say not taking that role, right? That's you know the empathy piece of it. That looking as the the person, it was the messaging. It was the right the demonstration of the key point across you're trying to get across uh i i saw a lady her name was diane pottinger um she was a ceo of mid michigan medical uh rest her soul recently had there was a tragedy there but she taught me the value of really building an inclusive environment uh she asked me to come speak to her at mid michigan medical and when we got up she saw the different faces and different talent levels and and she said, Billy, we're going to dance to close out my annual operating meeting. Now, meanwhile, she's dressed like a princess. And I got on, a, I have on a pink shirt, pink tie, pink socks. And she staged this. I had no idea she was doing it. And she said, Billy, we're going to come up front to close out the meeting. and We're going to dance. And I'm like, we're going to dance? She goes, yeah. So I get up. I, you know, I'm a black guy. I'm like, I got rhythm. I'm going to stereotype myself. Right? <laughs> I get up. I get up and I'm ready to do possibly a Kenny Chesney, right? And the music comes on, a rap song. It says, so what me whip? So watch me nay nay. And I look at her like, what the heck are you thinking? We're <laughs> 50 years old and we're doing dance to a rap song. She never looks at me. She goes, she keeps doing the whip and nay nay. What do you think I did three seconds later? Okay, the whip and the nay nay. Yeah, what do right. you think the whole audience does two seconds later? The whip and the nay nay. <laughs> what did she do? She created a safe space so you can change, a right. safe place so you can be authentic. And leaders have to embrace that. It's not just your way, it's the way of the enterprise. So 
right, encompassed and governed by standards. You know what? I want the best talent on the field. You know what? We interviewed a person at Goodyear as a male, and the person notified us that when they show up, they would be a female. And me and that VP said, so what's the problem? The person looked at us and said, and then we did a session where people wanted to attend. This person wanted to share their journey. Do you know there was standing room only in the room? People embraced that person where others thought that person wouldn't have been accepted. And in fact, there were people that had children and, rel and relatives that were in the LGBTQ community that benefited from that discussion. And they knew how to work and, and be inclusive with their family members, how to love again. Right. And so that's the thing was creating that environment, that learning environment that will help leaders and teams avoid those missteps. Excellent. Excellent. So recently uh, you struck out on your own. You started yeah. a, call, uh, a, a company called uh, Link XL. Yes, for Linked okay. Excellence. Linked excellence. Um, so a couple of questions there. Um, uh, why'd you start it? And how'd you come up with the name? So I started it around, uh, I left. It's always been my passion, operational excellence, connecting people, process, and tools. And that's the word linked. Okay. And excellence is, this is how you achieve that, right? It, it's how do you link it? When linking is not only the people, process, and tools, it's also, do people know what winning is? Do they know right. their role in the team winning? And then more importantly, what's your operating system connected to? Right. So when I, I left Goodyear, I was actually going to just ride off in the sunset and do the book and relax. Uh, no Printing Australia. Uh, Peter Bullis, I met him at a conference. I went over, we started putting the, the process in place there. I had great results. Did it in a couple of companies. Had tremendous results. At that point, we were like, companies kept calling me, friends kept calling me, and we realized we built a software and an operating system process that connects and links the, the people, process, and tools, so we started the company. Okay, uh, we, so we, you have a partner in this, uh, or partners in, so, in Linked Excel? So it's just myself as, as, a, as a sole uh, proprietor, proprietary. Uh, yeah. but I have some, uh, I'll say we, it's my wife and I as well. Uh, and I have some practitioners, uh, Dave okay. Fisher and Aaron Bushner. So these okay. are industry experts that we go in and here's what we do specifically. We architect operating systems. We're business operating system architect. We don't try to go in and say, do it the Toyota way. We don't go in and say, do it the Numi way. We say, let's do it your way based on these core principles. Right. And then we architect it. Right, right, right. Um, when you get in, to these companies, do they really know what they want? No. Yeah, you have to help them snap it into focus. And, and it's kind of like, do you, you want a house? Do you really yeah. know what you want? You know where the rooms, you know what room. So we architect that with you. Right. Right. It, and, and, and it's up different. to yeah, you just help help to design it because they're sharing with you what their desires are in a house, Absolutely. what you know, how many bedrooms, what the kitchen looks like, et cetera. They're helping you. Uh, and they're sharing with you their dreams and aspirations. Absolutely. And then you become the architects, the business architects, mm -hmm. in order to uh, design a uh, path to Absolutely. their dream. In this case, it's Absolutely. a business operating system. And then you nurture them on the building out of that dream. A Absolutely. Right. And every once in a while, somebody's going to say, well, I don't really want the cabinets there. I want to move it a little bit. And then mm -hmm. you help make those adjustments. Right. We move the cabinet because once we, yeah. once we move into the house, we realize that doesn't quite work. Right. So then we, we architect, we have architect the change. Right. Right. Very uh, cool. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. So you made mention of a book. Mm -hmm. uh, lay it on us, man. So it's called The Winning Link. And so this is it. Those that can see it. Yep. And The, the winning, winning Link, link it's, it, it's, it, it helps you not only develop your strategy, but deploy your strategy. And then help you execute your strategy. But more importantly, how to govern it. How to once you put these changes in place, how do you sustain the gain? So 
it's really the book is uh, uh, many practical examples of over this 30 year career, not things that I did so well, things that I didn't do so well. Right. Companies that, and things in organizations that I work with that I've seen struggle with these things and here's how they overcame them. So it's right. more so a practical guide. Right. Okay. You know. So um, now I, I've written a book, as you know, um, yes. and I know uh, what caused me to start writing a book. And so I, I want to walk through your book writing journey because uh, there's a lot of out, a lot of people out there that um, talk about writing a book, think about it. Very few of those people, I'm going to call them the 2%. Maybe even the one percent, maybe even the half percent, actually ever write the book. You know, yeah. those people that think about it to actually doing it. So, I want to just talk with you a moment um, about when did you decide you wanted to write a book? Uh, there were several people in the industry that that came into some of my organizations and said, "Billy, this story has to be told from a process level." And so I kept blowing it off. I was saying, "No, no, no." And then there was a uh, person connected me to McGraw Hill, and I actually pitched the the concept. And I, and two days later, I had a book offer. So we did the content, and I thought, now this is serious. And so I've always wanted to write this book. I had the passion. I had the content. Um, but this is hard. <laughs> yeah. And and, and, and so. That's where it all came in. I had the idea for probably 10 years I've been thinking about it, 10 to 12 years. Uh, and then I committed to it upon retiring. But I'll tell you what, I wrote this, rewrote it three times. So we did it. I looked at it and I said, we, I keep saying my wife, I, I pitched stuff off her and some of my friends and I'd come back. And I'd say, no, that sounds too, it's this, this, this educator. This, I don't want to do that. Then we got the practical side. And then we started talking to the janitors. We started talking to the, the frontline supervisors. Then I started talking about the plant leaders. And then we said, this book should be for everyone at any level. And so we rewrote it again. And then we said, mm, not quite. And then we got the final edit. So this is a year plus now going back, writing, rewriting. And we had something we thought, Whoever picks this book up at any level will walk away understanding operational excellence, business excellence. Um, and, and right, it, it can't be just about successes. What did you do wrong? Right. What mistakes did you make as a leader? Right. Right. And, right. and so how did you overcome those mistakes? Right? And it's almost like the the, the person that uh, I, I, I talk to quite often is my younger brother. And he goes, I want to know what's the problem that people can encounter and then how do they deal with it? And once they get out of it, how do they sustain it? How do they, because Billy, I heard you say, um, people go and put these processes in, then they walk away. Now the new leader comes in and tears everything down. How do you present that? How do you uh, prevent that from happening? And, and so we say, if you buy a French fry at in, in, in New York, Texas, the Ukraine, Russia, um, Poland, Germany, if you walk into Golden Arches, that French fry tastes the same. It's the standard. Except that you could get a beer with your French fries and burger here in, uh, at McDonald's in Germany. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, there's standards, but there's variants at the same time. Absolutely. You know, but, you know, what you just said really resonates about, you know, you have a business operating system going on and things are going well. Um, mm -hmm. And then some new leader, usually some C level person, comes in and yes. starts, you know, overturning the the apple cart. Okay, yes. it's it's almost like the new dog in the neighborhood has to piss on everything. Okay, yes. just to leave its mark. All right. Yes. Yeah, you know, I think about um, you know uh, the succession of presidents we've had recently. <laughs> you know, we have one executive person doing an executive order to undo the previous executive order. And then the next president comes in and, uh, you know, undoes that previous uh, executive order again, you mm -hmm. know, and I don't know if there's any thought behind it other than, you know, the previous guy was bad and yes. I have to piss on that just to leave my mark. Absolutely. And, and I don't believe that that's a, that's a very effective way to lead certainly it causes chaos in the organization, whether it's a company or a country. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I think that, um, you know, a, a there's a saying in the old Navy, okay? When there's a change of the watch, uh, the new person coming on watch was not allowed to change the sails for 30 minutes because they didn't understand why they were set that way in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think that's mm -hmm. that, you know, we should think about that when we're the we're the new guy on the watch you know uh, and you know not just to go in and start changing things until we understand why they are the way they are in the first place and Activist, not everything has to be changed i agree with you in in in, in most cases uh this is personal experience and through observation in most cases when you go into an organization you should spend the first 30 days seeking to understand, not seeking to change. Now, there's, if it's blatant, you should address those things. I'm not saying don't hands off. I'm right. saying, but you need to understand what's working, what's not working. Don't, don't, because when you go in changing it, you lose credibility or you, you, you offend the natives. Right. Right. right? And then, and the natives, and then if you don't have nothing better, this happened today with one yesterday, one of my practitioners, we were rolling out, we were architecting something. And the arch, my, my, my practitioner kept saying, well, I don't understand this. And why would you do this? And this is that, this is this. I said, so give me a better solution. Right. And I don't I have think one. That, he didn't have one. He didn't have one. Yeah. He had an and opinion. so what'd you do? And so when we, I said, this is our starting point based on what they told us the current condition was. Here's the target condition they want. Let's start with this framework and work from this based on what they see as far as reality, constraints. Right. And then we'll build countermeasures to improve this system. And then he said, I agree 100%. Right. I think sometimes, and this is a real something we really need to caution against, I think sometimes, especially if you're going in there and making um, uh, changes very quickly yeah. when coming into a situation, that we end up treating the symptoms and not the root cause. Absolutely. You know what I mean? So, you know, that 30 days or even 100 days not changing anything until you understand the situation, it gives you the opportunity to see through the symptoms and yeah. investigate what those root causes might be. Um, I... Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, and, yeah, go on. Sorry. Well, I, and that's the thing when I say leaders, you think about those egos. Egos can erode effectiveness. When the when the people come in and want to start changing things out, it's not about the process, it's not about the team, it's not even about the results. It's more about them. And as you said, making their mark. They just right. want to make their mark. You know, make your mark on impact on the value proposition, not who you are. You know, the greatest compliment I ever received when I left an organization was, and it was in a place where me being a minority from day one, everybody thought was going to be an issue, was never an issue. Were you ever not a minority? You just said, when I was a minority from day one, it's like, well, from, from the day you were born, right? I would imagine it would be day one. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. And yeah. so I knew I walked in, but I never walked in thinking about the glass ceiling. I always focused on the right. sticky floor. Right? right. That I can control and things. But the, the person walked up to me and I was leaving. And he says, Mr. Taylor, I want to say something to you. I, had, I When you first came here, I had some concerns. I had some concerns how we were going to jail as a team. And it was just different. It wasn't about biases and things. It was just, it was different. It felt different. And, 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 but after a week, it wasn't different. It wasn't different at all. And he says, well, what I, what I want to tell you is the person that's replacing you, who was standing right next to me, he says, sir, you're not going to have big shoes to fill. You're going to have big hearts to fill. Yeah. And that's Good what he one. said. He, he made us feel valued. He, and I'd say on Fridays, you know, leaders say casual day, Friday, you can wear jeans. And, and this is back when everybody wore slacks. But on Friday, the leader showed up in, in, uh, in a, a, a three-piece suit. But he, that leader says casual day. It's, what he's saying is casual day, but what he's, what he's implicating is you better not take advantage of it. You better not take a sick day. You better not do this. 
And, and so what I would say is I made it a point to wear jeans on Friday. I made it a point to be casual so that I'm saying I'm all in. And on Fridays, I'd say if your business is running good, I don't need you here 14, 16 hours a day. But again, if they saw me there 14, 16 hours a day, that was the standard. So they had this thing called Billy Plus Five on Fridays. So they, <laughs> they and I didn't know this until I left. When I drove through the guardhouse, the gate on Fridays, if it was three o'clock, the guard would let everybody know, the ship operations manager know he's gone. And everybody else left, right? <laughs> now, everybody says, I said, that's just a point, meaning it's okay to leave the plant. I'm willing to do it. You should do it. But make sure your business is in order. I'm glad you just said that because to me, sometimes in business, there's too much focus on the inputs and not the outputs, mm. okay? If I'm done with everything by four o'clock, and everybody I, I'm reported responsible to or for um, is, uh, you know, is up to speed on everything that I needed to deliver to them. Then why do I have to sit there for another hour or two? You know what I mean? It's like, so here's you know, a I, new, I, yeah, go on. The new concept that's in the book. And, and, and when I started, this was the breakthrough when we started architecting. We introduced this concept called KPAs to KPI key performance actions, the inputs that deliver the key performance indicator. So think about it. If I stand on a scale every morning, my goal or vision or mission, whatever, is to lose weight. I stand on the scale. What is that? That's a KPI. My KPA, which is still can be measured, is did I work, work out? Did I watch my calorie intake? Did I do the, If I did this right and I get this right, I'll get this. And it's like you said about the cabinets. If this is wrong, then I need to go back and change that to confirm my hypothesis on what I'm going to deliver. Yeah. And so we built this thing with what's your CPI, the critically most important indicator on why you exist. Now, your actions should drive the indicators that give you that. Right, right. I, I got to share with you something I did this is the early 2000s. Okay, I've been in business since 1985. It almost makes me uniquely unemployable, right? I've, I've run my own companies since 1985. Um, <clears throat> early 2000s, uh, I decided to do away with tracking vacation and sick time. Okay, did away with it completely. I was looking at it and, you know, we're doing payroll every week and, you know, tracking people's, you know, time off. And it's, it's like, why am I tracking this stuff? Why are we, why are we going through the effort of tracking it, approving it? Okay, mm -hmm. God forbid. Um, you know, we're not, we're not good year. Okay, so yeah. there's nobody that can hide behind the water cooler. You know That's what I mean? Right. We, everybody could see the work and the work could see everybody and everybody knew what was everybody was supposed to do. And so if there was anybody slacking, that would be readily noticeable, mm -hmm. okay? And conversely, if somebody's done uh, with whatever it is and their responsibilities are all fulfilled, um, that included, of course, you know, personal uh, education, you know, initiatives, mm -hmm. um, why, why do they have to be at the office? Why do they have to be on station? Um, you know, they, yeah. so I did away with it. And I, I completely left everybody to um, uh, almost semi-autonomously. You know, everybody was re responsible for everybody else and mm -hmm. themselves, of course. And, and, and it was, well, first off, it was empowering, okay, to the individuals because they're like, oh, my God, you know, it, you know, we're not being micromanaged. I mean, we're able to, you know, see the obstacles and figure out a way over them, around them, or through them. You know, mm -hmm. we're not, we don't have to sit there, hit that same obstacle, have a, you know, sit down, have a smoke and wait for further instructions. You yeah. know, we're able to, yeah. to, to, and, um, and it, I'll tell you what, it helped me scale my business yes. because I no longer had to worry about compliance. Everybody was, you know, mm -hmm. was responsible enough to be, to ensure self-compliance. Mm -hmm. And that meant that I could grow my business. I didn't have to make sure everybody else was doing their job. Correct. Yes. You know, yes. and, and that was a really an awakening moment for me in my entrepreneurial career. Yes. No, I, I totally align with that. Definitely. No, you know, one of, for me, 
One of the most beneficial things I've learned from my mentor is that that clarity piece. That clarity piece is, is of the most important. It's step one in everything we do. Right. Your marriage. You talk about clarity. I'm fine. It means two different things. But if you don't right. know that, it's a secret. Right. Right. And, and as you said, you can't manage a secret. So. <laughs> So we're getting up uh, to the uh, the end of time here on our on our interview. I've, I really got to tell you, I've enjoyed every moment of it. Um, I, I do hope that we cross paths in real life sometime. But I got you know two things I'm going to ask as a sort of like exit questions. Sure. Uh, the first, you just mentioned mentors. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, who were some of your your mentors uh, if you wanted to recognize them? Absolutely, um, Larry Robbins uh, was a gentleman that was my first um, uh, operations leader that really engaged me and taught me about standards and taught me about what you accept, um, you can't change. And um, so Larry was one that held hard to the standard and we became best friends. And I'll tell you, he's the first and only person to ever write me up. And it was not following the standards. And, and he, I remember him saying, don't don't mix our friendship with business. The standard is the standard, and, and so Larry was one of my 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 my, my biggest mentors. Um, I've had Greg Guy. He's a he's been a mentor on the, the people side. How do you engage people? Recognize people. Uh, and my 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 most influential. And then there's Pat Hurley, who taught me about. He, look, he, he he told me, you, you, him and Chuck Runner, you're nobody's token. Every time you show up, Billy, you deliver. Don't you ever forget this. And this is, I was a young manager when they reinforced that message. And the last is my mother. Yeah, you my mentioned your mother a couple of times. And I was going to ask, she seems to have been very impactful uh, in your life. So I wanted, that was going to be my next question is, Tell me about your mom and how she uh, was uh, impactful in your life. Incredible and, and, and incredible person. Um, when I say my mom was very impactful, she believed in you investing in yourself. And she'd say in yourself, investing is like banking. If you don't deposit anything into yourself, how are you going to withdraw anything out? And she would hold us to those standards. Uh, when I wouldn't take opportunities I thought I wasn't ready for, uh, the question she asked me, and it's in, in, the, in, in my book, she said, if a bird lands on the branch, son, does the bird trust the branch or does it trust its wings? She says, I've seen many birds land on branches. But what I have never, ever seen is a branch break and a bird fall and die. Often they fly higher. And so she would hold us to those standards and that, that personal ownership of you and what you do and things you can control. And if you have that focus, you hear me say, not the glass ceiling that holds most people back. It's the sticky floor. You hold yourself back because someone's told you what you can't do. Someone's told you what you can't accomplish. And recently, and I was raised, I was blessed. My aunt, my great aunt raised me and I had a biological mom that we're really close. Of all my mother's children, I kind of had two households. I went back and forth. It was good and bad if you got in trouble. But uh, one of the things that I would say that was reinforced over and over again, you own most of your success. You own it. It's not what people say you can do. And recently we talked and it was, she said, you've gone a lot further than what we ever thought was gonna happen. She says, but what I know now, you haven't gone as far as you're capable. That's powerful. That's powerful. And a lot of people that are watching this podcast, somebody has told you what you can't do. Even if it's your wife, your sibling, a friend, they try to limit your success based on their capabilities and what they believe is not possible. It's up to you to decide what is possible and what's not possible. 
It's up to you to invest in yourself, to take yourself to a position of, of what your goals are. You can reach those positions. You can reach those milestones. Invest in yourself. And if you do that, what's impossible is infinity. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Billy, uh, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for taking uh, your time. I know you're a very busy uh, gentleman. Um, it's been a tremendous experience having you on. Uh, your book, again, is? The Winning Link. And so, the Winning Link. yeah, you should buy it and get your link to success, right? Your personal yeah. link to success. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Billy. Have a great rest of your day. You do as well. Thanks for having me again. And bye, My everyone. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to State of Readiness. You can discover more episodes and learn about the book written by Joseph Paris of the same title at www.state-of-readiness.com. You can learn more about Joseph Paris at www.josephparis.me/card.